Hello and welcome to Trans AM. I'm Sarah Johnson, Executive Director of the Metro Trans Umbrella Group. The Metro Trans Umbrella Group is a trans-led grassroots organization that centers trans, non-binary, and intersex adults in the metro area and provides social emotional support and builds power for transgender adults. Too often our narratives are uh, told by cis folks and it's time for us to take the lead in telling our own stories, which brings us to today's topic, which is storytelling. And I have with me two fabulous guests. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Hello. Hello. What's up? What's up? Why don't y'all introduce yourselves? Um, I'm Josh Spartan. I'm a poet and storyteller and writer in yeah. St. Louis. And I'm Jarek Steele. I'm a storyteller, writer, and co-owner of Left Bank Books. Yes. Right on. So today's topic is all about storytelling. So much of what this uh, platform is, is just making sure that we're claiming space as trans expansive folks and uh, taking up space um, to tell our own stories. And so you two are two of my favorite storytellers. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I want to know, well, why don't you tell folks what kind of storytelling you do? Oh, what kind of storytelling do we do, Jared? Uh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I do personal essays mostly and a little bit of longer form, but most of what I write, um, I like to explore what I think of as this, uh, sort of a radical vulnerability. So instead of um, doing something that I, where I know where it's going, I'll just start something and start asking questions and see where it leads. Yeah. I primarily work in the medium of poetry, mm -hmm. um, very much stream of consciousness, um, kind of prosy, um, long form pieces. And I primarily write to perform on stage. So a lot of what I do is intentionally being written so that I can perform it mm -hmm. um, as a trans woman on a stage and being very um, exposed, but also very raw and real. So that's kind of what I do, I think. Yeah. Tell me how storytelling became a part of how you are in the world. I started writing, maybe you might have this similar experience from a very, very young age. Like I would write in journals, I'd write little poems, I'd write comic books, I'd write short stories. And I don't know if they do these things now in schools, but when I was in school, they would have these writing contests every quarter. And some kids would enter, but I would always enter the <laughs> writing contest. Most people didn't want to, but I was one of those kids that always entered. And I don't know if it was just because the, the things were good or that I was the only one entering, but I always got little <laughs> ribbons. And I just remember maybe that reward, like consequence, like, oh, wow, someone gave me a little ribbon for writing this. I'll write another one. And then I write, write another one. Um, but I would, I was always writing as a kid, even when I wasn't in school at home. And then it just kind of blossomed from there. So it really started from a very young age for, for me. Yeah. Did you start writing to um, perform at first? No, 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 no. I, no one ever asked me as a kid to read anything, mm -hmm. but I would just write it because yeah. um, we would do, these, like I said, we would do these writing contests and the teacher would, the teachers would always want the kids to participate and only a couple would you know yeah. and but i was one of the kids that always <laughs> entered the writing contest mm -hmm. and each writing contest was different like like one grade we did poems another grade was like a short story i remember another year i did a little comic book where i made my own comic yeah. <laughs> So it just was just something that I would just do because it was one of the activities in school that our teachers would promote and I would just enter it constantly. Yeah. yeah. I think storytelling for me uh, was a little bit of a survival mechanism. Um, my sister and I were really, really close. And the first stories I told were to her. So <laughs> it was, you know, pretending and making up storylines that would last for years and years and years wow. um, with all of our st stuffed animals and with the two of us. So and that's, you know, that. yeah, I mean, <laughs> we started, you know, one family storyline when we were probably five and six years old. And then that lasted all the way. Embarrassing long. We won't go into that. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was the same storyline. And it would just weave in and out. Um, depending on what was going on around us. And then I started writing later on, but the verbal part of that was, was first. For me. Mm -hmm. 
just oral storytelling mm-hmm. with props. With, your- with props. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So then how does your trans identities, how did that come? So I'm hearing about your younger days, but how did that become part of your writing? Because that's how I know you both to be writers is expressive, beautiful, vulnerable, real talk about trans experience through your lens. Um, one of the first things that I wrote specifically in that lens, I was in college and I did a long form, um, like capstone feature piece for, cause I went to journalism school. I okay. went to the Mizzou school of journalism mm-hmm. and for my senior year, we had like a capstone of like long form magazine writing. And I remember that was the year Dewana Johnson, um, was murdered in Memphis, Tennessee, and she was a black trans woman who had recently filed a major civil rights lawsuit against the Memphis Police Department because she was brutalized by the Memphis police and it was caught on camera Mm -hmm. and she mysteriously wound up murdered Mm -hmm. very shortly after she filed this huge civil uh, rights lawsuit. And so I went to Memphis and I interviewed some of the trans community down there and I interviewed some people in my own personal trans community And that was the first time I really started delving into trans narratives and trans and exploring just my own, my own personal transition at that time too. So that's kind of the first piece that I did. Um, And then from there, it just kind of like blossomed into like really being intentional with telling trans stories, but from the perspective of a trans woman. Yeah. Yeah. Mine uh, evolved over the course of several years, just like my transition did. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I started writing more about my discomfort with my body first, which I didn't really understand to be connected with uh, my transgender experience, weirdly. And that happens a lot when I write. So um, I wrote an essay called Size Zero, which compared my weight from before transition and after because I gained a lot of weight and then lost it. Came to pack. And I started writing this essay and thinking that that was what I was going to write about. And then it turned into this other thing that involves this um, this trailer when I was 14 and uh, a fifth of vodka and loud music and porn playing on the <laughs> on the TV. And this, and this weird experience that I didn't connect with what I was writing about. But like I said before, I start to write something and then it goes, it takes a whole other turn and it goes somewhere else. And I think the best writing does, it starts to ask questions yes. um, rather than answer them. Yes. And so that's what I, I tried to do. That evolved into more of a trans thing that was connected with um, sexual violence and um, a little bit of discomfort with with that. But um, so that's, I guess that's my process. I don't write specifically about being trans, but a lot of it is because right. I am. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. and I love what you just said about asking questions because mm-hmm. I have the same perspective with my work is that yeah. I'm not really trying to tell anyone about any sort of like truth about the world. I'm actually writing right. about trying to find truth of myself and my experience. Mm-hmm. And in doing that and being intentional with my writing, it kind of was a documentation through my pieces of my own transition and discovering my own gender identity and comfort with my own body and my how I wanted to be um, seen and felt in the world, right? So I totally relate to that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I appreciate, I think, about both of your writing styles and your writings is that it's truth telling, it's narrative, and it's just not... It's not the typical way that we're spoon-fed our narratives, right, in the media. It's the journey, but it's different aspects of the journey that I think is relatable on so many different levels, right? Um, Especially, like, in queer culture, relatable. Right. Yeah, Yeah, I call myself the Pornhub poet of St. Louis. (laughs) (laughs) The trans Pornhub poet of St. Louis. But um, (laughs) but no, yeah, I think think that... There's some amazing trans narratives out there right now in all different forms, whether it be yeah. film, yeah, whether it be music. Uh, music, screenwriting, poetry, personal narratives. And I think it's all valid and it's all really great. Um, but I think there is something to be said about the, the um, in St. Louis, the talent that is here yes. of creative people and especially queer and trans creative yes. people and the, the work that we're doing in St. Louis and the narratives that we are creating. I, I'm really impressed every time that I, I'm here and I'm 
witnessing yeah. the community produce amazing pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, along the lines of community producing, you just are off the heels of a writer's workshop. Right, it was right here yes. at HQ. Right. <laughs> yeah, so tell tell folks about that. Yeah, um, so it was a um, three-day workshop titled uh, Cicadas and Coneflowers Writers Workshop for Trans Writers of Color. It was a space for trans writers of color to come together and work and hone their storytelling, um, their creative narratives, and it was led by trans women of color. It was um, a mixed group of all different kinds of people coming from different backgrounds. We had some playwrights, we had some poets, we had some like like more personal essay type people. We had a songwriter here. So there was amazing work that was produced. Um, it was kind of uh, a brainchild of mine because I've been asked many times to do workshops and I've always been shy about doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would be like, um, no, like, cause I'm just like, I don't think I'm that like, like, well, in other years, I've always been like, I don't think I'm ready to teach anyone anything. Yeah. But then I had had really great milestones with my career. So I was like, okay, maybe I, it's time. And part of it was a selfish thing. I was like, I'm tired of being the only trans woman at readings, yeah. <laughs> surrounded by cis yeah. people. Yeah. Um, and definitely, like, sometimes the only person of color at readings of, like, white uh, um storytellers or poets or writers in St. Louis. Um, but, you know, that is, the, you know, the nature of the beast, right? So I was like, what can I do to not be the only <laughs> trans woman at these readings, especially the trans, oh, trans woman of color uh, at these readings? So I was like, well, maybe I'll just do a workshop and try to, like, give people the confidence to go out there and share their work because I had to be um, kind of guided into this work, too, because I was very shy and very, like, like guarded my work really close to the chest um, for a long time. Cause I was like, Oh, is anyone even going to like this? But it took people welcoming me. So I was like, well, maybe if I welcome some people to the table that will like create something new. Right. So it was amazing. It was yeah. an amazing experience and everyone produced work that was just outstanding and everyone produced work that they hadn't had before they got here, which yeah. was, was one of my goals, I think. So they weren't working on something when they got here? Some of them were working on stuff, but, like, they definitely either honed it and it was something, you know, new through critique and workshopping or just totally doing something brand new. That's great. So it was amazing. It was really great. It yeah. was a great. And thank you, M Tug, for hosting us because Yay. it was in this space. Mm -hmm. It was so much love was, like, in the room, and um, it was just really amazing. Well, I think it's amazing that you were able to be a possibility model for so many humans to like sort of instill that mirror and be like, you are a writer, you are a creator, mm -hmm. let's do this, let's take up space. I'm interested, Jay, how in your life did you come to that place of being able to take up that space as being a writer? Uh, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, I I uh, am really lucky in that my family supports me, my friends support me yeah. uh, to do that, and uh, it, I it's what I do. It's not something I have to grow into. It's I have to write. It's yeah, I have to do it. It's what I'm doing. I'm doing it right now as I'm talking to you. I'm right. thinking, how can I write about this? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so growing into that isn't something I would say that I have done as much as. Um, let the world grow into it around me. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the only way I can think about it. Um, and it's important to me to to I have to be doing it in so much so that uh, I'll just be really really real here. A couple of years ago, I had a nervous breakdown. Um, it, was, it was really terrible. It did a lot of psychological damage. And during the course of this, I lost my ability to read at all. And I have always been able to just read, you know, dense texts. There's like like huge books and just not miss anything at all. And this happened and suddenly it was gone. I couldn't read anything. All of the marks on the page just looked like these little squiggle lines wow. that were in this white sea of wow. panic. It was just panic. And I couldn't do it, couldn't do it, and couldn't do it. And um, finally, I decided that I would try to write. And I got on my keyboard and started to type, and I could write. I couldn't read anything I was writing, but I could 
I could type it. So that muscle, uh, that muscle didn't go away. I was curious, do you write every day, Jarek? Is that part of your process? I do. I write every day into my phone, mostly in uh, the dark in my truck. So I'll um, be thinking about things and have to write. They'll pull over and, you know, start to type it into my phone. I don't have any, like... Uh, set time of day that I do it to mm-hmm. you? Mm-hmm. I don't have a set time. I find that I write most and I find that I write the best work that I do at night. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is. I'm kind of a night owl. So yeah. like I like late nights into like like three, four in the morning just writing. Mm-hmm. And I use my phone a lot too. Um I again I don't have a set time. I don't write every day. I know that's like a, a writer faux pas. Like every <laughs> writer says write every day. And I definitely believe that. I just it's hard for me to train myself to do that just yet. But I do find that a lot of work that I produce sometimes starts on social media. So things that I write on my Facebook or my Instagram Mm -hmm. or my blog end up being filtered into my, my, like my pieces because basically social media is just stream of consciousness, Mm -hmm. right? We just add pictures and emojis to it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, my phone at night on my laptop. um, And then sometimes um, I have, I I do like the process of sometimes writing little notes, like Mm -hmm. handwritten pieces of paper, which have definitely grown into pieces as well for me. Um, But I love that you write every day. I need to be more um, diligent with that. Well, I should clarify that because writing for me is also revising so i'm not yes, writing new content it is, every it day is. sometimes i don't have the i don't have it yeah no yeah so yeah. i'll go and i'll just pick up something that i wanted to work on and just rewrite that no that's definitely true it's not yeah re- revising editing and is definitely a part of the process yeah i think people get con- confused when people say oh write every day is like oh i don't have that much to say <laughs> no, every <me> day <laughs> i don't so i'll i'll just one essay i rewrote seven times completely wow it started as a personal essay then it was a love poem and then it was a letter and then it was something else i just kept rewriting it and rewriting it and rewriting nice. it but i still consider that new right it was right just, no it is you're yeah. definitely right i like that i like that perspective yeah now you when you did your writer's workshop you were setting up sort of a place of possibility modeling yes. for other trans women yes who who are your are possibility models? Who are my possibility with models? With writing. With think, writing. Yeah. Um, well, one of the artists that we taught I, uh, during the workshop, um, there, her name is Kokuma. She's a poet based out of Chicago. I got the immense pleasure of touring with her um, a couple of years ago. And she just has an amazing breadth of work and the way she performs it and reads it. Um, it she's amazing. So I would highly recommend anyone watching this look into Kokomo, read her stuff, buy her book, support <laughs> Black trans women writers and poets. Um, she's one of my biggest, biggest heroes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, that's someone I really love. Um, is it anyone that you're really digging right now? Well, I mean, uh, not it's trans specific that I'm that I'm reading right now. I some older things that I that really influenced me were Stone Butch Blues. Oh, uh, so yes. Yeah. Uh, Lenny Breedlove wrote Godspeed back in, I think, 2002. And that was phenomenal. It was like this Kerouac kind of, uh, but queer. Queer as fuck. It was, just, it. Yeah, it was really great. And right now I'm reading Argonauts by Maggie Nelson. And uh, so those are some of the, some of the things. But. Yeah, that fill you up. What about as young humans? What was early on in your reading? Oh, God. What what spoke to you? <laughs> oh, I will. I'm a big fan of William S. Burroughs, who's mm. a St. Louis native. Mm-hmm. And the first time I read Naked Lunch and uh, Queer, I was just like, wow, this is this is fucking writing. So I mm. I gain a lot of of uh, my 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 style like from those texts because they. Yeah put such a huge mark on me but uh, one of my biggest literary heroes is james baldwin yes. um yes. notes from a native son um go tell it on the mountain mm-hmm. like giovanni's room like mm-hmm. i just i just 
like any any James Baldwin, just please give me more of it. I'm holy, holy person. I really do believe. So mm-hmm. we're I'm really lucky to have those texts with us. So those yeah. those some of those are really things that resonated with me growing up. Definitely. Yeah. What about you, Jay? Um, well, I will go completely sef- like the other way from this. <laughs> I was raised really, really strict Southern Baptist, and so me too. Yeah. Hey, what up? <laughs> So, <laughs> and I'm not well adjusted. You know, I think we can all t- we all can see what that does to a person. Um, no, but the fir- the very first thing the first thing at length that I read was the Bible. It was the King James oh, version the of the Bible. Bible. Yes, and you know yes. there's a lot of damage to be done there, but yes. it, uh, there's also some seriously killer writing in that the Bible text. So the Bible, yes, yeah. So that's it's fucked up. It's, <laughs> it's so fu- fucked it's, up. It's really fucked up. <laughs> And it's, but but that's what I what it started with, which I guess really, is, oh man, says a lot about the nervous breakdown. But um, that's where I started, yeah. and I think that um, learning that language and learning those really messed up stories and yes. recovering from those messed up stories yes. has informed a lot of what I've done. So I would also piggyback on that by saying that a lot of my performance techniques, I really do honestly yes. feel yeah. I gained from mm, being yes. in fire and brimstone churches and okay. tent revivals and old school preachers, old, mm, old yes. school, like not yeah. the new ones, like the ones that really mm. just <laughs> got really in your face and said some <laughs> fucked up shit, <laughs> but you're a kid and you're just like, oh, okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, people sometimes tell me like, oh, like, how do you perform the way you do? Like it's, it's it's very specific kind of experience, right? When I'm reading, and I I really honestly believe it's just soaking that in at a very young age, having to deal with it and grapple with it and mm-hmm. like deep program myself from it. Yes. But having that like fire like instilled in me, mm-hmm. um, because when you're young, like you don't really know much of what what that process really is. But I remember people being so entranced by these preachers and so fervent about it right and that's intoxicating it is intoxicating to be the person delivering it but also being the person Mm -hmm. receiving it Mm -hmm. so i really believe that that's one of the reasons it was one of the reasons i perform the way i do and because i think it's something that will probably never get removed from my brain (laughs) but this way but now it's like (laughs) radical tranny like (laughs) proselytizing so that's why i like it the way i like it (laughs) Yeah, I see that definitely when I watch you perform. It, it, it reminds me. It's like this this whole this whole thing. You take us to church. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I guess the advice, right? We get to that portion of our interview where there's lots of emerging trans, expansive humans who want to take up that space. Right. And, you know, like there's not a ton of possibility models out there for right. us. And so how do you guide or suggest or encourage the next gen or? I would, yeah. well, I would definitely recommend read other trans writers, yeah. like soak that in, mm-hmm. see what your peers are doing. Um, I, I, I I don't want to be like grumpy old grandma trans, <laughs> but I mean I think I think the the era of like the the think pieces needs to be done and mm. over with. Not saying that you can't write like timely like essays or poems or anything like that on a specific subject, but I really believe this concept of um, realism is the future trajectory of trans literature. Mm -hmm. So like taking the very real mundane parts of our lives and not thinking we need to like write these think pieces every single time. That's just the same thing being like hashed over, over over and over and Um, and doing it really for this model of like, you know, consumerism Mm because these people want things now. Mm -hmm. So fuck that. Forget that really hone in on the realism of our lives. And out of that, I really believe will be some amazing work produced. So that's my kind of advice for people right now. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would echo that a lot. That's uh, read, 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 read as much as you can. And maybe don't write every day, but think every damn day, every day, analyze, ask yourself some questions and be vulnerable. Don't think that you're right all the time. Don't think you're right any of the time. (laughs) Just think, read and write. 
So do you all have any things coming up, anything you want to plug or promote or? Oh, I would say one, speaking of like book deals for trans writers, Tori Peters, I would definitely recommend as an amazing writer. She just got a book book deal. Um, and that was a pretty big one. And so I'm super excited that people are finally, (laughs) finally, finally coming to, you know, trans writers, um, and actually giving them legitimate space. Base, right mm-hmm. at the table of like the literary yes. publishing industrial complex is what I call it. It is hard to buy trans books for that bookstore. Yeah, by the way because it, you have to really dig, and they're all. Uh, this is probably not even you don't care about this for the podcast, but it is really hard <laughs> to find to stock those books. Yeah, because the big publishers don't want them. They don't want them, and so they you're buying from small. Yeah, the smaller yeah. publishers, which are going to have limited. Like stock, right? They're gonna have limited. They're limited cost. stock, and the the discounts are terrible. So it's really right. hard for an independent bookstore to do. Right. So that pisses me off. Anyway, so um, back to the topic. Yeah. The only thing I would plug is that, um, well, you know, I did my my big wagon show in yes. St. Louis a little bit ago. So mm-hmm. I am excited that I am touring with that uh, coming up this year. I'm going to be performing it in Kansas City next weekend. So I'm super excited for that. I performed it in Austin, Texas in February. I did St. Louis, obviously, the home show, which was amazing. So I think my goal is just to really try to tour with that piece. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm hope I want to take it to Chicago for sure. I want to see if I can take it to some other places. So I'm doing that right now. Mm -hmm. Um, The workshop was such a success. Um, that we are talking about doing another one next year. Yes. So hopefully we'll have more money, more people, mm-hmm. and that will just, I hope that becomes like a kind of a standard thing. But, you know, if it doesn't, it doesn't. But I definitely want to do it again next definitely. year. Yeah. Um, and I have... I mean, you could you could air this. I don't care about this. But um, I also have my next like kind of big project is I want to produce a um, magazine. I want to, I want, you know, because I'm kind of the person that's kind of the opposite where I I hate engaging with the literary industrial publishing mm-hmm. complex so i just kind of do it myself and yeah. i self-publish a lot of my stuff mm-hmm. and so i figure well if i'm not going to be submitting my pieces to editors i should just become an editor <laughs> so i'm going to mm-hmm. create a magazine that's the next big project down the that's pipeline okay. so i know that's going to be about like another year or two years of work but do you think specific to st louis or yeah i want it definitely regional like i definitely want it to be something that is a st louis production Um, But, I mean, I'm I'm open to opening up um, space for people to contribute that are not from St. Louis. But it's definitely going to be like a St. Louis queer, trans, Mm -hmm. radical publication. And I I love the concept of having a physical, Mm -hmm. you know, like I love the physical page Mm -hmm. and the physical color and the gloss and all that. So that's that's something down the pipeline. That's my next, next big, big project that I... That's exciting. Yeah. That's really exciting. (laughs) That's exciting. Taking up space. Yes. Creating those avenues, being our own possibility models. Yeah. Telling our stories and getting them out there. Um, I would just like to talk about, like, maybe, like, when it comes to performing, like, our styles are very different. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you see yourself when you're on stage um, sharing your work, whether it be a big crowd, a small crowd, an intimate space? Um, what kind of things go through your head? Because I get nervous even to this day before I get on stage. Oh, I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I was terrified to be here. Ah! Yeah. yeah. No. I, yeah. My sister came with me. You can ask. I was in my truck. <laughs> um, I'm really, really nervous. Uh, I almost back out almost every single time. Oh, no. And but you're then, so great. Your work is so great. <laughs> but my stuff um, isn't all written for performance. A right, lot of it right. acts differently on the page than it does when I'm talking about it. And I swallow right. my words. And so I have to really, really, I'm not like this a natural you know, <laughs> fire and brimstone kind yeah. of guy. <laughs> and I swallow my words. So I have to really pay attention to slowing it down yeah. so I'm not galloping through. Yeah. Um, and I wrote one thing that we did at the Fringe Festival, say, Aaron, mm-hmm. I did. And that works much better performed. Right. I have to perform that one. Um, the Much of the rest of it, are like my poetry and some of the the essays really don't work if I perform them. Right. So, um, 
So it's it's a mixed mixed kind of thing. What about you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I I I again, I just kind of kind of taught myself mm-hmm. how to mm-hmm. be a performer. Um, I. I, I think I learned a lot from drag watching oh, really? like yeah. drag queens perform, oh, yeah. even though they're doing a totally different medium, like owning a stage. I just kind of would mm-hmm. soak that in and I would live my little drag fantasies in mm-hmm. my head. But then people would invite me to read my work. I'm like, OK, well, I guess I can harness that confidence somehow. So I I know part of that, obviously part of what we're talking about with like growing up in like a very fire brimstone church and seeing like people in front of you, mm-hmm. you know, orating and, and just, um, and I'm just make loving people, like loving people watch, watching them gag, like, right. <laughs> I, it's intoxicating when they're gagging and they're like, and it's like, Oh, okay, I guess I can do this again. Oh my gosh. Yes. All right. Well, I want to thank you both for being on the show oh, today. Thanks. Thank you. It was yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah, and thank you for taking fun. up that space in our city and and being voices for us right. and sharing your narratives. Right. I mean, I think just the last thing I would like to say is that I I really hope that, you know, the by us being out there and by us giving space to other trans creative people and storytellers that it just it just flourishes right like there's no reason why it just has to be us too you know at the table it should should be all of us you know anyone that wants to share their story share their narratives obviously there's a process to it and sometimes it could be intimidating or scary to be vulnerable but i hope by us doing things like this it gives people the confidence to be like yeah i want to tell my story i have something to say and i just the more the the more the merrier, right? Mm -hmm. The more voices we have, um, the more voices from the marginal, marginalized and from the borders, I think is what we need right now. All right, so that's it for to for this episode. Um, be sure to subscribe below or on your podcasting app. And so, thumbs up. <laughs> and right. thumbs up. Yes. Thumbs up. Um, to and follow the Metro Trans Umbrella Group on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all the social media sites. Comment below. Send us a message if you want us to talk about something. Send it to us. We want to hear from you, and we'll see y'all next time. Thank you.